All right, Blake. Yes. Blake, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I am from Fresno, California, which is up north a little bit from here, about four or five hours. Tell me about your family growing up. You had both your both your so folks? So I am the oldest of uh, three boys. Uh, I'm 29 years old. My middle brother is 26 years old, and my youngest brother is 22 years old, currently going to college at uh, Santa Clara uh, to become a lawyer. Hmm. Yeah. Are you the black sheep of your family? You know, I would definitely call myself the black sheep, and I would also call myself the scapegoat. You know, growing up, I learned about all those different uh, profile types as different, as we play different roles throughout our family. And the more and more I read about it, um, you know, my family kind of always used me as an excuse to, uh, I was the troublemaker, you know, and they always use that as an excuse to kind of point the finger at me. But I would definitely say I, uh, I earned that role, you know. It's nothing that they did, and I definitely, yeah, I played that role well. I played that role well. I almost, I owned it, you know, after a certain amount of time. Do you think it was just something you have in your DNA and your personality no. naturally, or something happened? No, there was something specific that happened, you know. When I was 16 years old, I happened to buy weed at school one time, and uh, something happened where the kid I bought weed from, he uh, got caught. And I got called into the office and my principal asked me, did you buy weed at school? Yes or no, tell me the truth. And I'll never forget this moment because this moment in my life was a tipping point. He said, look, you could either deal with me and I'll help you or you could deal with the cops. And so, of course, a young kid, you know, I was scared. Uh, I got caught buying weed at school. I told him, look, per, uh, to the principal, I did it. I did buy weed at school and I'd much rather deal with you than the police. Well, instead of helping me, he actually lied to me. He immediately kicked me out of school as a uh, sophomore in high school. And at the time, getting kicked out of school, my dad had no idea that I'd started doing drugs or smoking weed. My dad was devastated. I'll remember the first time when he came into the office that day, he put his head down on the office table and started crying and asked, why did you do this? And what's the reason I'm telling the story like that? Because there's one theme that I always learned from that moment forward is that you never tell the truth to the authorities. That's just kind of something that was told to me, taught to me at a young age at that moment. The first time I ever told the truth was the last time I ever told the truth because when I did it, it immediately got me kicked out of school and and they, they lied. They, they said they wanted to help me and they didn't, you know? And so from that moment, moving on, you know, um, I then went to continuation school, which is a school in Fresno called Gateway. And Gateway is not a normal high school. It's a continuation school for all the kids who get kicked out of high school. And so that, I was going to school now, high school, once a week. Only on Wednesdays I would have to go to actually show up in a classroom. And all the other days I was doing work online. This allowed for me to start smoking weed all the time and hanging out with kids who got kicked out of school as well for doing similar things. And so the ball kind of got rolling uh, for me to be that scapegoat, me to be that troublemaker like I always, you know, like I said, I always owned up to. Yeah. Hmm. You graduated eventually? So uh, from there, okay, um, from there I went back to high school my junior year and uh, something I didn't mention yet, but since a young age, since the age of about nine years old, I've played baseball very competitively. I was on the best travel ball team in Fresno called the Twin City Twins. That's from the age of nine to about 12. I was on the River Park All-Star Little League team, which was the first team in Fresno to ever go to the actual Little League World Series that's on, on television that you watch, you know? We were on television and we were the first team from Fresno to ever do that. 
And uh, my high school that I went to, which is a school called Clovis West in Fresno, they're a Division I uh, program, and they have a very good sports program. So I went back my junior year to a baseball team that was one of the best baseball teams in the nation, and I was one of the top third basemen in the nation as well. And so um, something that always helped me was that even though I got in trouble, I was an athlete. And you know, athletes in high school get taken care of. They get, uh, they get tutors, you know, they get the benefit of the doubt with their teachers. They get, uh, they can take their tests at different times because they have games. And so their teachers will kind of show them more leeway. So the fact that I was a baseball player definitely saved my ass because I was always, um, I was always getting into trouble, but they, but, but I was such a good third baseman that my coaches would figure out a way, you know, to get me out of trouble and to make sure that I was there on game day. And so, uh, yeah, I went back as a junior, had a great junior year. I had a great senior year and I, uh, eventually ended up getting a college scholarship to go play baseball in college. So, uh, the scholarship I got was to a Christian private school in Fresno. I'm a Christian. I was to a Christian private school in Fresno called Fresno Pacific. And um, Fresno Pacific. Um, so I went to a Christian private school and coming from a high school that was really like all about partying and drugs, going to a, a college program like that, I felt like I went backwards, you know? I wasn't allowed to have girls in my dorm room. Uh, we had a curfew. There was a zero tolerance policy for alcohol and drinking. And so, like I said, I, I, uh, I didn't enjoy this college that I had chosen to go to. And so I, uh, I told you this when I met you, the main theme of my life and my story is that I feel like there's always this piano about to fall since I got kicked out of school as a 16 year old because, um, I feel like there's always this piano that's about to fall. So rather than let the piano fall and wait in suspense, I go cut the cord right away. So at least I can say I am in control of it. It's like this illusion of control that I want to have. And so um, I told you that I didn't really enjoy the college I had chosen. So I started doing cocaine every single night. And uh, I actually got kicked out of college as a freshman as well for doing cocaine and ecstasy as a baseball player. And so I got kicked out of high school as a freshman and I got kicked out of my first college as a freshman as well, both because I kept it, both because I chose to keep doing drugs instead of and enjoy the life as an athlete. You know, I, uh, I was very fortunate to get an experience that not a lot of people get in life. First of all, going to college, um, I was the first, my dad never went to college, so I was the first man in um, my family to get a college degree. That was very, I'm very blessed to have that opportunity. And not only that, I was very blessed to get the uh, experience as an athlete in college as well, which you think it's cool in high school, in college you're getting free gear, you're getting you know uh, newspaper articles written about you. And so for me to fuck that up, excuse my language, am I allowed to cuss? For me to fuck that up because I wanted to keep getting high, uh, Something my dad always taught me was you can get high when you're 80, 90 years old, man, you know, do it then you do all the drugs you want because you're, you know, at that point, you got nothing to lose. But when you're young and you have this body, you know, and you're an athlete, you have this opportunity to see something that not a lot of people get to do. Take advantage of that. Don't don't take it for granted, because one day you're going to look back on it and you're going to regret it. And so. I got kicked out of college as a freshman, um, took a year off, went to a city college for another year and had such a good year as a sophomore at the city college. I got another scholarship to go play baseball now in Monterey. And so Monterey, I don't know if you've ever heard of Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is one of my favorite places in the world, Santa Cruz, California. Monterey is an, another city near Santa Cruz. 
And so uh, I got a scholarship to a division two there called Cal State Monterey Bay. And Blake? 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 I'm sorry, I literally just no, freaked it. Cal State Monterey Bay. Cal State Monterey Bay, yes. Okay, so I got a scholarship to go play baseball now at Cal State Monterey Bay. I had one of the greatest years playing baseball of my whole entire life. Um, I then got a scholarship to a Division II in Santa Cruz, like I was telling you, called uh, Cal State Monterey Bay. And uh, they're known for the aquarium that they have in Monterey. Uh, it's one of the nicest aquariums in California. Um, it's a little surfer town, you know, I like to call it a stoner town, you know, a lot of skateboarders and just, it's a really laid back area. And it just so happens that my parents also have a house in a place called Capitola there, which is like a really, uh, bougie, high class little, um, surf town that's, you know, real preppy and a lot of people of, a. uh, that of an older age demographic live there and a wealthier age demog or wealthier demographic as well. But um, I went to uh, Cal State Monterey and had two of the greatest years um, of my life there, just overall. It was two years where I actually wasn't deep in my addiction because I left my hometown for once. And so I wasn't able to readily get drugs like I always was when I was in my hometown. I, I drank a little bit like a college, I, I drank a little bit like a college student normally does. You know, I um, smoked weed here and there, but for the most part, I just had a great time living at the beach and um, experiencing my last two years of college, you know? When I look back on it, um, yeah, it was two of the best years of my life because I wasn't, suffering you know a lot when i was young 16 like i told you i was suffering from addiction i couldn't stop smoking weed to save my life even though it meant my baseball career i couldn't stop popping pills even though i wanted to because i mean it just i just couldn't stop that's the story of addiction is that you want to stop you know on skid row there's no one here that wants to be here there's no one here that wants, I mean, barring a few people, you know what I mean, in, in a few moments, no one wants is, is here because they chose to be out here, you know what I mean? It's because that we, we suffer from a disease, you know? And it's a disease where you tell yourself that you don't have a disease. That's the saddest part about it. And so, yeah, those two years in Monterey, I didn't feel like I was suffering anymore, you know? I was away from home, and uh, I don't know, I get emotional talking about it because <laughs> the last 15 years, man, <laughs> I don't know, I feel like I've lost control of my life. There's been a lot of suffering, you know, and a lot of like loneliness and 
when I graduated from college, you know, I went and I started working for my dad as a manager of his company. And uh, I grew up as a welder. You know, my dad has a welding company in Fresno, the biggest manufacturing company uh, in the United States. And so I grew up as a welder. I started welding when I was 13 years old, welded to when I was 26. And then when I was 26, I started managing the company. I managed operations for him, I, which means that I got the welders what they needed to build the equipment. I would go get the parts. I would organize shipments and everything, whatever. I'd set up everything so they had what they needed to build the equipment. Well, during this time, I met a girl that I, uh, I fell in love with. She's a, I'm a hundred percent Armenian. That's my, my ethnicity. And so that means that I, I need to find a girl who's a hundred percent Armenian as well. So that way I can continue the bloodline and our kids are a hundred percent Armenian. And yeah, so I met a girl who was Armenian just like me. And it seemed like a match made in heaven. Uh, this girl was way too good for me, way too good for me. She was a Sunday school teacher. She was a 29 year old virgin and she was if I am the devil, she was an angel. You know what I mean? It was like polar opposites. And for the first time in my life, she made me want to do better. She made me want to stop doing drugs. She, because, because I knew I wanted to marry this girl, um, I knew that I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be hiding my drug addiction from her the rest of my life. I didn't want to lie to this girl. If I was going to marry her, I had to be honest and I had to be able to trust her. And so something, uh, that changed my life happened. Uh, I, I, for the first time in my life, so for, so for 10 to 15 years, I had been hiding my addiction from everyone, from my parents, from my girlfriends, from my coaches, from my family. I always hid it. Even though I got kicked out of school, I was always good at hiding it and keeping my appearance good from the outside. Well, once I started dating this girl, I decided that I'm going to tell my family and I'm going to tell my girlfriend that I have been suffering from addiction. I've been taking pills every day, going to work. I can't go to work without taking pills. I can't wake up even and get out of bed unless I take 20 to 40 pills. And um, no, all of it. Once I told my family that I had an addiction, at first, you know, they were by my side. They said that they were going to help me out. They sent me to my very first rehab. And uh, I went to rehab. I was sober for one, two months, and then I relapsed. And, you know, they supported me again, sent me to my second rehab where they were still supporting me. And uh, went to my second rehab and... You know, two, three rehabs go by and the story of relapse and all of a sudden my family, they don't have hope anymore. You know what I mean? They went from very hopeful to they start reading about addiction online and the statistics and all the different things about you're an addict for your whole life. Once they start reading these things, they, they started to lose hope. And uh, yeah, when I admitted that I had an addiction, my life changed. My house got sold. Um, I lost my job. I lost my girlfriend. I lost my dog. I lost my car. I lost it all. I lost everything. And since that day, um, the last two years, I've been going to rehab, relapsing, living on the street. And I mean, that's what brought me to Skid Row. I was in rehab three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, I was in rehab. I got kicked out of rehab for... Um, for hooking up with a girl in rehab, I got kicked out. That rehab was in Orange County. Uh, when I got kicked out, I came here. That's, that's how I ended up here in Skid Row. And I've been here for three to four weeks ever since then. But it came from me going to rehab. I, I mean, I want, I, to this day, I still want to be clean. I really do. What is your drug? My drug of choice is, first of all, marijuana. Like I said, it started with marijuana. Then it's opiates. Started with Norcos, eventually went to heroin. Now, nowadays it's fentanyl. Nowadays it's fentanyl. I smoke heroin at times or fentanyl when I could find it. You know what I mean? But that's expensive as hell. And then crystal meth, 
Xanax. The only thing I really don't do is drink. I've never been a drinker just because I, I don't know why. Alcohol to me is just, I, I just don't do it. But there's really no drug that I I don't do. Are there, are there addicts in your family? I am the only addict in my family that I know of. I have one uncle who is an alcoholic. And he now is a born-again Christian, doesn't drink at all. But I am the only addict in my family. And that's the toughest part about it. My, it's weird because that's not true. My family and my culture is full of alcoholics. But it's different. Alcoholics are looked at vastly different than drug addicts. And that's one of the main differences is they look at me like I have this problem, but they drink all day, even at work, even on Sundays, and they don't see that as a problem. It's no different, you know what I mean? But I, for me to say that is almost like an excuse to them. You know, they don't want to hear it. They don't have a problem. It's me that has a problem. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's tough to deal with because all the information they have is they have no experience with it. It's all coming from the internet. It's all coming from what other people say. And man, I've tried so hard to fucking, to help them understand what it's like, but I just, I don't, I don't know, I don't think they can understand. Where, um, are, you, where are you staying now? Right now I'm staying I'm in a tent. Staying in a tent on Skid Row that with a with someone I just met a couple weeks ago and and uh, how are you supporting yourself? There is no supporting myself. I haven't eaten any food in seven days, man. I just carried a fridge ten miles last night that I found on the street to hopefully sell it today to get some money to to pr hopefully you know what I mean go get some food and get high. But you know the truth is is that uh, this. This opportunity right here was one of the best things that I could ever do because, um, you know, I, I want to go back to rehab. I still have insurance. I still have insurance that's really good. And so I want to go back to rehab. You know, there's also a bunch of arrests in my story. There's a lot of arrests that I didn't even mention. And, uh, you know, it's not that they're important, but the fact of the matter is, is that rehab is where I need to be. It's not that I want to... Do I want to be in jail? No, I want to be in a, in a facility getting better. You know what I mean? Curing my sickness. A sick person should not be in jail. A sick person should be in a hospital or a, a facility. You know what I mean? And so. Are you talking to your family? No. No, I haven't spoken to my family. And no, I've spoken to them in the last couple of months, but not in the last since I've been to Skid Row. You know what I mean? So, but you still you still have hope of getting your life together. Absolutely, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm going to do it. You know, I read a quote one time that said, "Success is falling down seven times but getting up eight. You know, I could fall down twenty times as long as I get up twenty one times, I'm successful. And so, man, you know, getting being out here. I mean, people say you need to hit your bottom, you know what I mean, to overcome this addiction. Fuck, man. There's nothing more I want to do with drugs. I'm over this. This isn't fun anymore. This isn't, there's no fun being had doing drugs, okay? When I was having, look, when I had money, that's when I was doing drugs. That's when I was high all the time. You're not high out here on Skid Row. None of us have money. None of us are able to even purchase the drugs that we want to purchase, let alone food or clothes. Look at my hands, man. I haven't showered in four or five days. Look at this sweatshirt. You know what I mean? Look at my hair. Look at this beard. Like, I can't even tell who I am when I look in the mirror, you know? If you saw a picture of me or you saw what I look like when I was working and when I was doing it, just, it's, it's, it's fucking scary, dude. But, um, you know, this is what drugs does to people. And... What's, you know, your big, what's your biggest fear now? My biggest fear is that my mom or my dad die while I'm out here, you know, and I don't get a chance to fucking be there for them, you know, or I miss out on something important because I'm, I'm a family person, you know. I'm the oldest, like I said, of all my brothers, and 
You know, you can't trust anyone out here, man. It's fucking terrible, dude. By nature, like, I'm a good... I, I want to help people, you know what I mean? I want to I wanna have relationships with people, but every single person I've had a relationship with in the last couple of years has just turned out to fuck me over, man. And that shit's hard to deal with. Like, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Most important lesson I've learned in my life is that, um, I don't know, don't take things for granted because you're not going to get this time back. You know what I mean? And uh, I hope I can look back on this time. You know, I'm still 29. I'm still young. I hope I look back on this time and say, you know, I'm glad I did it when I was young. I'm glad I experienced all that stuff when I did experience it because I, I, I could say I got it over with because I... I'd much rather be doing it now than when I'm 50. I see guys out here who are, they're done trying. You know what I mean? This is where they're gonna end up. And I just want this to be part of my story, part of my trajectory, not where I end up. You know what I mean? All right, Blake. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I hope you get it all together. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, I hope I never see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Blake.